Hello and welcome to The Hill here on News Nation. As the race for the White House hits a new phase in just a few hours, all the lead up, all the hypotheticals, all squarely in focus. As the first votes in 2024 will be cast tonight in Iowa in just a few hours. So, does Donald Trump win in a route, or might, of all people, Vivek Ramaswamy potentially prevent that? Can Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis pull off a stunner? And if not, where do they go next? Thanks for being with us here on The Hill. I'm Blake Berman, joined today by Chris Steyerwalt, News Nation political editor and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Chris is live in the Hawkeye State joining us. Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House chief of staff, News Nation contributor as well, uh, here with us throughout most of the show. And here in studio, Ford O'Connell, former Trump campaign surrogate. Ashley Davis, former George W. Bush White House official. Michael Starr Hopkins is a Democratic strategist. And Johanna Mosca, former Obama campaign official and News Nation contributor. From the Beltway to the Hawkeye State and beyond, it is a big day in politics. And the Hill on News Nation starts right now. All right, you are looking live right now. Downtown Des Moines, Polk County, Iowa, population of about half a million and a whole lot more eyeballs than that are focused on Iowa's most populous area. Hop in the car. Hopefully you got some all-wheel drive in the Hawkeye State today. Head about 115 miles east down I-80. And this is a live look at Iowa City, home to the University of Iowa. Quite the education for some first-time caucus goers uh, who will be on campus today there at uh, the University of Iowa. All of this in pursuit of that. Live look right now just down the road from us here in Washington. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Republicans trying to flip the White House from red to blue. And it all starts tonight in 1,657 precincts in 99 counties with four Republican hopefuls. Hello to you all. It feels like wherever you are, if you're in Iowa or here, there's snow. Uh, And we're going to see how the weather has an impact, uh, if it does or if it doesn't tonight in Iowa. I don't know. We'll see. But all of this kicks off here in a few hours' time. Chris Steyerwell, come on in. I want to go around, really, to the table and just sort of get a sense of of what everyone's seeing and what everyone's hearing. But, Chris, let's start with you because you are in Iowa. Uh, Tell us what you know, my man. Well, look, this is a big expectations game. Uh, What Donald Trump wants to do here is sort of put the race away. Uh, he has been a dominant front runner here, never leading by less than 20 points in the Des Moines Register poll, which is the gold standard. And what he wants to do is get to 50 percent or better and have his opponents in the in the Republican Party, have those factions in the Republican Party start to give up and just sort of curl up and die. Um, <laughs> we have seen Nikki Haley move into second place. We have seen her get ahead of Ron DeSantis. The big question tonight, more than anything, the two big questions, more than anything else, can Trump get to an outright majority, number one, and number two, can Ron DeSantis ruin Nikki Haley's chances? Because she's got to get free of him. She's got to get ahead of him here to get the kind of momentum going into Iowa she needs. If Ron DeSantis has a surprising showing, gets into a clear second place, outperforms Haley, that is going to hurt her chances going into New Hampshire. All right. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, come on in. Uh, I, you know, I say it all the time. Uh, y- you know more people, at least on the Republican side, than anyone I know. And I wonder, who, with the folks that you're talking to, what they're saying. Yeah, they're saying exactly what Steyerwalt just said. I think those are the two big stories going into tonight. And then what we look for at the end of the night is, does Donald Trump get above the 50 percent? Keep in mind, he can win here and still show weakness if he sh- wins with 42 or 44, 46 percent, that's technically a win, but it's not the, not the knockout blow he's looking to, to, to inflict on his, on his opposition. And number two, that second, that second place race between DeSantis and Nikki Haley, absolutely right. Nikki's actually going to have to deal with heightened expectations because of this good polling data. Mm-hmm. If she had finished third a couple weeks ago, no one would think twice about it. But now they expect her to finish second. If Ron DeSantis pulls a little bit of a surprise here, not an upset, but if he overperforms and finishes second, it completely changed the dynamics going into New Hampshire and into South Carolina. So those are the two stories that I think everybody will be watching very closely tonight. 
Okay, okay. Um, you, you didn't, when, when Mick was saying, you know, 40 might be, you were sort of shaking your head there. Yeah, I am shaking my head. The reason and, but, and, and so explain why, and then I also want to know why, what, what you're hearing. Donald Trump is going to win the Iowa caucuses. The only question is by how much. And I find this sort of narrative about 50% to be a little bit deceitful, given where we are with the weather and everything else. The record in Iowa is 12 points. Donald Trump is going to smash the record for sure, and they're not taking anything for granted. Where Mick and Chris are right is that Donald Trump wants to wrap up the nomination tonight, and if he does get 50%, it will be game, set, match. Look, can um, I just go on numbers, though, before you chime in on Haley? Because I just want to, like, set some expectations here that a good caucus turnout is, like, 180,000 people. So it's not that many people. And that means Trump, to get 48%, only needs about 90,000 people. That's 0.02% of the U.S. population. So This is we, Iowa, not the U.S. Just, tonight. <laughs> but, this is Iowa, but, not the but, U.S. But it does actually, like, matter in terms of the expectations. Iowa does doesn't always set the precedent for Republicans. Hardly and I'm ever. sure you'll go into so, this. ever. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you're, in, you're in Nikki Haley's orbit. Um, what are you hearing and what are you looking forward to tonight for Nikki Haley? Well, I think that she has, she feels very good about everything that's happened in the last few months. She's the one that's consistently going up. Ron DeSantis and Trump are continuing to go down. And the reason everyone's talking about this 50% is because President Trump said 60%. Now he's down to 50%. So I, everyone's looking at that Trump's number because of them. Trump's downplaying expectations. I think Haley has to worry about beating DeSantis. Fair, what is, a good, the, what is a good night for Nikki Haley? I, I think if she comes in second or a very close third, I think it's fine. If she comes in third by two, three, four points, I mean, I think that that's all relative, especially since DeSantis is not going into New Hampshire now and going straight to South Carolina. Right. I, I mean, yeah. I think that there's a potential that by the end of the week, there's, it's a two-person. Okay, race. so from the very distant second and third. By from the day. Democrats' perspective here, um, we just heard from, from a, a few different Republicans and, and Starwald, of course, to, to start us off. I'm wondering from the Democratic perspective what you're watching. Yeah, if I'm DeSantis, the problem becomes what happens after Iowa. There's no path for him. He doesn't have the ground game in New Hampshire. He's going to go to South Carolina, and South Carolina is a Trump state. Nikki Haley can't even do well in South Carolina, her own state. So the question really becomes where's the path? If Haley doesn't do well and doesn't come in second, even if DeSantis comes in second, what happens after he gets out of Iowa? This is where he put all his chips in. Okay. The best candidate the Republicans have is Nikki Haley in a general election. The question is whether Iowa voters are going to see that tonight and whether she can get a ground game, an organization, because that was what she was using against DeSantis, saying she organized his campaign, he was just spending on ads. She's saying that she has it, whether that shows tonight actually will matter in the general context. I debate whether or not Nikki Haley's actually a better general election candidate. She has not been receiving the media scrutiny, and I never take advice from Democrats when they want to tell me <laughs> so, who's the best general <laughs> election candidate. We have the media and the Democrats seem to be trying to prolong the Republican I just party. want to know real quick, we haven't talked about Vivek Ramaswamy, and by the way, yeah. Vivek Ramaswamy is going to be joining us live from Iowa here on this show in about 22 minutes' time. Chris Steyerwalt uh, and Mick Mulvaney, come on back if you don't mind. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why, obviously, you know, the polling shows he's Ramaswamy is, is running, I don't know, somewhere around 8%. But is, is his, I don't want to say importance, but one of the things that we're watching, the fact that maybe he does hold Donald Trump under that, that 50% uh, threshold or level. Well, certainly that's what Ramaswamy would like to be able to say. He would like to be able to say, I was the spoiler. I'm the key, the last piece of the puzzle for Donald Trump. Uh, I think he's full of beans. Um, I think that uh, Donald Trump doesn't need Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, but I think that uh, this is a sort of a hostage situation. Ramaswamy's yeah. campaign doesn't go on. I mean, he says he's in until November and he'll never leave or whatever else. But the fact that Trump's campaign is thinking and talking so much about Ramaswamy that's yeah. where the narrative about 50 percent comes from. Their emphasis on this piddling number of votes, right, this 5 percent or whatever it's going to be, their emphasis on that speaks to their fixation on that, that uh, outright majority number. Yeah, and you saw Trump attack Ramaswamy for the first time over the weekend, saying he's not MAGA, he's fake, don't support him. I think the Trump team knows that most of the Ramaswamy voters are going to go for Trump, and they'd love to have, I think the number I, I saw, Chris, was 8% in the, in the DMR yeah. poll, maybe it's 5 but whatever it is, 
If you assume all that's going to Trump, Trump would love to have that extra, extra five, six, seven, eight percent tonight. So uh, Ramaswamy playing it right. If he can squeak out tonight, keep Trump under 50 percent, goes to Trump in New Hampshire and says, I'll jump out if you make me secretary of state. It's a it's a leverage game at that point. But that will be interesting. Uh, interesting <laughs> subtext to watch. <laughs> I'm not sure how good that would be for the country. Situation. Yeah. 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 Barry 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 bottom, indeed. That would be a scare. Like, yeah. That would be scary. Oh, just him negotiating, <laughs> like, yeah. Major. I have an so issue with this because issues. Donald Trump is going to break the Iowa caucus record tonight. They're pretty much that's guaranteed. And somehow that's not good enough for the media. Why won't they say that? <laughs> that why won't the campaign say that? They basically, Chris Lasavita basically has said that. That's why that's the cool. internal number that they're talking about is 13. They want a 13-point victory because that's the record. What Mick is talking about is a historical record. No matter what they do, they know that the media is going to come after him. If he, if he gets 50, they're going to say it's expected. If he gets under 50, they're going to say, aha, oh, he's underachieving. That is absolutely true. Woe is me. You guys set the expectation game. Yo, it's Trump yo. who talked about the history historic numbers. Trump the media did set it. Now, now in Iowa, now. he's been so downplaying. I actually think that the media plays way too much into the narrative that someone coming out of Iowa is the only yeah, winner. I agree with I that. Mean, Ted Cruz, again, Pete Buttigieg. 90, expand on that. Expand on that. 90,000 people <laughs> would likely come out. If uh, if it was a high turnout night, let's see how many people come out and caucus for Trump. And that is about the size of three Galesburg, Illinois. That is not a massive you know, location. We, and so... It, here, the narrative will be on mainstream media that Trump has had this amazing night. And it's like, what? 90,000 uh, yeah, people? Yeah, let, me, let me say this. This is the point. is to cut off the donor money to Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. Oh, That's 90, why you don't. Know, it doesn't worried, matter. That's that, how our caucus is. You guys that happens, dumped out of the caucuses. No. Are you, After you, tonight? Are you worried that Absolutely donor money? Absolutely not. I mean, everyone knows that her big, you know, her big first shot is going to be New Hampshire. She's never overplayed her, her Iowa. She's I mean, at least, DeSantis is the one that put all of his eggs in, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. so, she's the alternative to Trump. Well, now, DeSantis is she's not the alternative to Trump. There's a, a ceiling money. for Nikki. Yeah, no, come on, Nick. Okay. Come Nick, on, Nick. Got something. Yeah, in fairness to Ashley, you're right. Nikki has focused more on New Hampshire, but if you look at the money that has spent, I think Nikki has spent more money in Iowa than any other candidate. So I understand that, you know, you're sort of not trying to set expectations too high, but it's not like she's been ignoring Iowa like DeSantis has been ignoring New Hampshire. If she comes in third tonight, she has to consider, a, you know, an underperformance. That being said, if she finishes second tonight, you got to think that DeSantis is out of the race, or there is a lot on the mm. yeah. on the yeah. uh, everybody there for her is nodding. All right. Uh, by the way, so we've been talking about the people, and rightfully so, right? These are the the four that have made it this far, that have put the time, money, the effort, and so on and so forth. But I, I just want to show you real quick if we could put the graphic up the issues in the state of Iowa across the Hawkeye State. What are the big issues that when voters go into those uh, caucus rooms, into those high school gyms, into those uh, homes in some point in some parts of the, the state tonight. What are they focused on? Issues that are extremely important to Iowa caucus goers. 81% say the economy and inflation. 80% say immigration and border security. Those were the top two answers when recently surveyed. Just consider that. All right, coming up. We uh, continue as we have our focus on Iowa tonight, a live look now where the temperatures, this is the other part of the story. Oh, boy. Um, right now, I think it's like negative four wind chills in the negative 20s. GOP hopefuls, though, have no choice to stay positive. So many questions heading into the Iowa caucuses tonight. Among them, is the weather going to affect things there? We talk about this all the time. You never know with the weather, right? Steyerwall breaks it down with some historical context on the other side of the break. And tension in Texas. Remember, we talked about immigration, uh, the border crisis there, a woman and two children drowning over the week weekend. So what is next as the standoff continues between the state and Border Patrol? Big day in news, big day in politics. Stay with us. We're back in a few. Nation, as we continue our coverage, uh, about two hours and 45 minutes at the start of the Iowa caucuses. You are looking live right now. The University of Iowa, the bone chilling weather there, it is expected to be somewhere in the area of 30 degrees below zero. Our colleague Kelly Meyer is outside Nikki Haley's campaign headquarters in West Des Moines. Talk to us, Kelly. How bad is it and what are you anticipating? I guess from the folks that you're here uh, talking to, what, what are they saying? Is, is the weather going to be a factor or no? 
Well, it's pretty cold here, Blake. We're out in it again for you, but it's even colder, I think, than it was on Friday. You can see my breath. You know, we're making snowballs here. Uh, but we're hearing that the folks, uh, the caucus goers, you know, they're tough. They're hardy. They're used to it, they tell us. And they're also uh, very thorough uh, in this uh, thinking in this process, thinking through who they're going to caucus for. Uh, they care a lot about this as they go out tonight. So from those I've talked to, every one of them says they're going to be out in this tonight. Take a listen. Do you feel like a lot of people are going to come out in this weather for him tomorrow night? I, I really do, because as Iowans, we want to hear people talk. We want to hear what they have to say. We're used to cold temperatures, and the blizzard's gone, so it's all good. Now, those were specifically Trump supporters that we were talking to. And for Trump, the concern is with, you know, he has such a lead uh, and such momentum here in the state. There might be some supporters who say, well, you know, with this weather, we might not go out. He'll still win. And that's why we heard him telling them, you know, uh, to go out and caucus as if I'm one point behind in the polls or to go out. And even if you're sick as a dog, even if you pass away, he says it's <laughs> worth it. So we'll see if those supporters come out here tonight. Kelly Meyer, live for us in West Des Moines, Iowa, brave in the cold, go back indoors. Thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate it, Kelly. Have a good night. Uh, so how will tonight's frigid weather affect turnout? Chris Steyerwall here to break it all down. Chris? So I don't know what Kelly's talking about. It's a balmy zero. Uh, we're at a, an absolutely toasty zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and all of that jazz. Now, it's going to get worse. Uh, right now, it's zero, and as the sun starts to set here, uh, the temperature is going to drop, and the wind is going to pick up, and it's going to be really nasty tonight. <clears throat> so let's start with a little baseline. Uh, let's start with what good turnout looks like. So here's your, here's your first magic picture. And you can see here, this is peak, this is the apogee of turnout, from for the Iowa caucuses. On the Democratic side, that was 240,000 people for Barack Obama in 2008. And for uh, Republicans, it was 2016 when Donald Trump and the Battle Royale brought out 186,932 people to go caucus. That's a lot of people. When was the last time that the weather was bad? Because it's been a period of, by Iowan standards, very mild weather here since 2004. 2004 was the last time the weather was bad. So uh, look at the hair. Oh, my gosh. John Edwards' hair still looks good all these years later. My gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> so uh, what, does this, what does this year's caucus have in common with 2004? There's multiple factors. Number one, it's cold. It's been snowy. Burr, uh, but also this, and this is something to remember when you're thinking about turnout. The Democrats have given up on Iowa, and I doubt they'll ever be back. Um, uh, there's only one party's caucus going on here. And there is a multiplier effect when, you, when both parties are having their caucus. It's more in the bloodstream. It's more discussed. It's more in the news. So there's more reinforcement, more reminders to go caucus. So this is a one-party thing. So is there a correlation? Do we have an iron correlation, Steyer-Waltian level correlation here between temperature and turnout? Ta-da, look at this handy chart that intrepid producer Caleb made for us. Uh, and you see here, cold weather has had typically lower turnouts. 2016, the weather was, by, again, Iowan standards, pretty mild at 27 degrees, and that was when it was the best turnout. And also, I'll re remind you that in 2016, when those big numbers came out, both parties were having a contest, right? Both parties were mixing it up. Both parties were trying to pick a nominee, and there was a lot more interest. Okay, so how cold is it really going to be? Now I get to finally be the weatherman. I've always been the politics guy. Now I get to be the weatherman for a second. And if you look here at our map, if you look here at our weather map, you will see that the parts of the state in the east are going to be even colder because as the front moves through, it's going to be even colder on this side. Whose part of the state is that? Whose part of the state is Cedar Rapids? That's Nikki Haley's part of the state. That's where Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis are duking it out. Is that a factor there? Uh, we'll, we'll, we can talk more about that. But here's the last thing I want you to take away. Out of how many voters, right? So percent of turnout matters, uh, but out of a whole number of what? And fortunately, <coughs> Iowa is great about this, and their Secretary of State's office has the deets. So here's your comparison about the eligible, what we call active voters. Now, 
this number can go up and Democrats are talking about coming in and they're going to crash the party and switch the registration, blah, 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 blah. But here's your number. 615,066 potential voters in 2016. The number is lower now than it was eight years ago, and that's because people have migrated to the independent side with a lot of reasons. 30% was not only, the, the overall potential number wasn't just high, but 30% was really high. If 20% is the number, which is, would be much more typical for the Iowa caucuses, we're looking at a dramatic decrease. We're looking at maybe 120,000, 125,000, not the 150, not the 160,000 uh, that a lot of these campaigns have modeled around. Uh, and I will. I look forward to arguing with uh, Ford and uh, wh- whomever else wants to. But we know the truth. A lot of Trump supporters are first time. Were first time caucus goers eight years ago. Many of them will come back. But remember, voter propensity. The best indicator we have for whether somebody's likely to vote. Did they vote before? And one time caucus goers. Maybe you're going to see a lot of fall off there. Nikki Haley's hoping she can get close because her voters are. Uh, more affluent, more likely to be college educated, higher propensity voters. Uh, and so she hopes that she can get it down to 15 points, 12 points uh, against Trump because of that. All right. Steyerwalt breaks it down. Chris, thank you. I know you got to run. Big night ahead for you. Uh, thanks for joining us, bud. Appreciate it. Stay tuned. Yep, yep. Um, Johanna, I will give you the last word because I know you've been to every yeah. county in Iowa. Well, and I have. Iowa does matter. To Ford's point, I, I love Iowa. I romanticize Iowa. But it, <laughs> wow. just context, it is, out of 340 million people, a very small state. It's number one. That's it. And that's why the Democrats got rid of it, because they couldn't deal with it with <laughs> Joe Biden. Got to leave it there. Uh, on the <laughs> other side of the break, Vivek Ramaswamy joins us live from Iowa. What is he expecting tonight? We're live in Iowa with one of the four remaining candidates. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is a live look once again, uh, University of Iowa campus. You can see the weather there, the snow, students among the many braving uh, the weather to vote. Now, once seemingly admirers, Donald Trump is now attacking Vivek Ramaswamy. Now, this all started with a tweet Uh, Over the weekend in which Ramaswamy was shown next to a group wearing a T-shirt, that T-shirt said, quote, save Trump, vote Vivek. You can see it right there. Uh, Starting on Saturday, Trump has since posted a series of messages on social media attacking Ramaswamy. One of them saying, quote, now all he does is disguise his support in the form of deceitful campaign tricks. Very sly. But a vote for Vivek is a vote for the other side. Don't get duped by this. Joining us live uh, from Iowa. Of course, he's in Iowa. Why wouldn't he be? Vivek Ramaswamy back on the Hill once again. Uh, Vivek, I, I'm sure it's been the, the busiest day of your life, or, or one of them, certainly. Um, so thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. I, I, I wonder why you think uh, Donald Trump is now all of a sudden starting to attack you. Well, look, I think that his campaign advisors, who I think probably are the ones that actually put that out or put him, advise him to put it out, and I think that that was probably not the A-team that was working on that right there, is seeing a late surge here for us in Iowa. That's the fact of the matter. Many of the endorsers who are coming out for us were widely expected to go for Donald Trump, the likes of Steve King, who was America First before America Mm -hmm. First was even a thing. Widely expected to go for Trump, he endorsed me late. A lot of the other state legislators and otherwise, one switched from DeSantis to me. So we're seeing a late surge of momentum, but I'm not attacking Trump. I'm not running against Trump. I'm running for this country. And I think that that's what I've said at every step. I admire him. I think he was an excellent president. But I think I'm going to be leading the America First movement to the next level, reaching the next generation as we do it. And I do think I'm speaking some hard truths on this campaign that make everybody a little bit uncomfortable. But that's what it's going to take to revive our country. Have you called Donald Trump? Have you texted with him since Saturday about this? Uh, No, we haven't. Not in the last few days. I don't think we've been in touch. Actually, for, for probably I can't remember the last time I talked to him at all. But you know what? I'm running my race. We have done more events than anybody else in this race. I've been to 390 plus events. That's more than any candidate in history. It's more than all candidates in this race combined. And so we've put in the work. We have not left anything on the table. And I think Iowans reward people who work hard. They're hardworking Iowans. We have been grateful to meet throughout this process. And it's been one of the most gratifying and I would say even 
eye-opening experiences of my life, meeting patriots in pizza ranches and diners who care about this country yeah. every bit as much as our family does to go through this. And so you I know, think that's going to lift say, us to success. I heard you say today, go to 100... Shock. Yeah, I heard you say today, go to 100 pizza ranches and they'll put you in your place. I mean, you've made hundreds of, million, hundreds of millions of dollars repeatedly. You went to Harvard. You came from nowhere to now polling in Iowa. How has this put you in your place? Well, look, I think that the good thing is that more candidates didn't do it. But I think in my experience, what happens is when you show up at the pizza ranch, it comes up and becomes clear that these voters in Iowa actually view this as a job interview, as they should. They're the interviewers, and I'm the interviewee. And if you're running for president, there's a lot that can get to your head. You have candidates coming in and out of here on private jets, do one big event and leave. Yeah, we've had packed events, but I don't just do those events. I also go into rural communities, meet with groups of 20, 30, 40 people at a time, and entertain actual hard questions that they otherwise don't get to ask in the media or in public forums. And I think that's a, a reason why Iowa goes first. At the start of this process, and a year ago when I was a businessman, if you had asked me, does it matter if Iowa goes first or not? I would have said, how does it matter one way or another? Now I'm an evangelist, and I am an evangelist with the ardence of the converted. These citizens here take their responsibility seriously, and I'm proud to have actually respected this process in a way that I don't think any other candidate did, certainly not at the scale that we did here on the ground. Do you actually think that you're going to win tonight, Vivek? I think we have a very reasonable shot at winning. I think we're going to shock. I'm certain we're going to shock the expectations. We're going to shatter the expectations that have been set for us. And I think I'm going to be the nominee. Keep in mind, the person who wins the Iowa caucus has actually not been the nominee the last several times around. But what Iowa does do is the person who has the momentum coming out of Iowa, the person who shocks the media's expectations, is actually the one who goes on to win the nomination. And that's so then where do, you play, do where do you play here, next? That, Be, so where do you play next? And I'm sorry for jumping in, but, you know, because you're right about yep. Iowa, you know, it, it, it sort of sets the table, but doesn't necessarily pick the nominee. But it, New Hampshire is maybe not your strongest suit. Nikki Haley is from South Carolina. We know Donald Trump is polling there. So even if you do, Vivek, exceed expectations tonight, how, how do you how do you go? Wh where do you play next? Well, I think that's going to change the dynamic in New Hampshire, where I do expect to outperform Ron DeSantis. I think that'll probably send Ron DeSantis out of the race. Then we're going to go to Nevada, Michigan, states that other candidates have actually ignored. But I think I'm the only candidate that has spent serious time on the ground in either of those two states. And so this is just the beginning for us. The media has done us a great favor of trying to count me out of Iowa, setting the expectations exactly where we want them. And so my message to every Iowan right now is if you want to stick it to the mainstream media and actually make them eat their words tonight, come out to the Iowa caucus, brave that cold, do the right thing for this country, and I am asking you for your vote. And if you do your part, I'm going to be your next president. And this is the first step of the journey that gets last, us there. Last, que last question for you here, and again, thank you for the time. Um, just since you mentioned thank Ron DeSantis, and we know he's put a lot of his, his money, time, and effort in Iowa, if he does not finish second tonight, Vivek, should he drop out in your view? Look, I'm not going to make the decision for what anybody else should or shouldn't do. I'm speaking for my candidacy. We're going to shock the world tonight. We're going to shatter expectations. That's going to propel me forward to the next phase of this race. It's going to actually cause us to do better in New Hampshire than the media has as a narrative there. And, and it's going to be a steady build for me from here on out. So I'm not going to begrudge any be in, other candidate, but I am standing for my own. And you will definitely be in New Hampshire tomorrow, no matter what happens tonight. Yes, Oh, okay. absolutely. We'll leave it there. In New Hampshire, and then Nevada, and then Michigan, and then the White House. Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, hope you come on back. Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, come on back in. Uh, you, what, what'd you hear there, and what'd you make of it? Yeah, look, the, the, what the man has accomplished is really impressive. He was somebody that no one had ever heard of, and now he's polling at third, fourth, or fifth to be the Republican nominee for president. And that's a tremendous accomplishment. But he's still polling third or fourth or fifth, and I don't know who he's trying to impress by staying in the race if he doesn't start moving up in, in the batting order. I also wonder, and i got to ask the rest of the panel, is it just me, or, or do you really, does it really rub you the wrong way when people who you know aren't going to win get on and say, I'm going to be the next president of the United States, yeah. and they're trying, like, as if they're trying <laughs> to convince somebody no, that that's the case. Is, uh, well, we, had, we, know, had four, we had three Democrats on Dan Abrams' show last Friday who said that, and Mick, I was, you know, I like Dean Phillips, he's on my podcast tomorrow, but I was kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> what I want to say, does it work on anybody? What I want to say, though, Mick, and I think that you'll agree with me on this, 
We have a really good, diverse set of candidates for the first time I think the Republican Party ever has. All three of out of four are young, two are diverse, and one's a woman. And I just think that's a, I mean, that's a really it's big step like forward like, for the Republican Party. <laughs> but I, six months ago, people couldn't even pronounce Vivek's name. And he's here. So he's already shattered expectations. Yeah. Well, that, that, and that's what Mick said. And I mean, look, yeah. the guy's worth a, hundreds of millions of dollars. He's but a Harvard it, grad. But, he's 38, 39 okay. with kids. I mean, he's done well for himself, but right? But people don't what's always the next run step? for president to win. Everyone knows that. There's book deals. There's name ID. He, look, he's a political neophyte. Ah, that's so he's sad. A political that's neophyte. so sad. That's why they're running he's for president. He's a political president. neophyte with a yeah. bright future. The question is, the future ain't now. But, this is Donald Trump's domination. 24, 28. I mean, 28 and beyond, he may be well in the race. Let's, okay, let, let's, let's take, let's take and, and Michael, come on in. Let, he just told us he's going to shock the world, shock the system. Let's just operate in a, Nick's laughing. Um, <laughs> let, let's just operate in, a, in an environment for a moment, and we'll all know in, I don't know, five hours or so if that's the case, but that does happen. What does that look like for him? I mean, I mean is, it, like, is like 12 shocking the system, or? Yeah, anything above double digits, yeah. I think, is shocking yeah, the okay. system. And, and would be impressive, but here's, I think, the problem for him. He said he's done over 390 events, and he's still polling it less than 10%, which is the problem that DeSantis is running into. You can't turn trolling into a campaign unless but, you're Donald but, Trump. But, but Michael, but he's also said vote. he's been to 100 yeah. pizza ranches. Yeah, okay, only 70 pizza ranches in vote. Iowa. Polls don't <laughs> vote, and he does have people who That's are enthusiastic about him. The question is, he just came on, he had his last minute opportunity to make his case. I heard he'd gone to a lot of pizza ranches. I did not hear what he was going to do for the waitresses and, and the you know staff at a pizza ranch and at a pizza hut and at all of the other establishments across Iowa. I didn't hear that, and that's the problem with all of these other candidates. They're not because making that Because he's argument. running for Trump as Trump with better hair. No, like, I don't know about that. He's, he has Trump something. Like, he, no, he missed his opportunity. Yeah. He's, what, no, name one he, thing he's running on. His, his, his opportunity is down the line. Honestly, he's raised a few questions in terms of okay. what I call the America First policy ideas, and he's pushing them to a whole new level in ways that I wouldn't have thought of in the beginning. All right, so News Nation's coverage of the <laughs> Iowa true. caucuses, as you might know, continues tonight, 7 o'clock Eastern, uh, with Leland Vitter. Leland is live in Des Moines. Then Chris Cuomo, Dan Abrams, Elizabeth Vargas take the reins along with Leland, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here on News Nation. Hope you are watching. Mick Mulvaney, we got to say goodbye to you. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. Are you on tomorrow, Mick? I'm in the You're studio tomorrow. With- I'll see you there. You're in the studio. Look forward to uh, breaking it all down with you tomorrow and, and seeing what you think happens from there. Uh, Mick, thank you. Have Thanks, a good guys. night. Have we'll a great catch night. You tomorrow. All right. Still on the other side of the break here, uh, a standoff in Texas. This is it, it's basically the state of Texas versus the federal government. Right now, Texas is telling uh, the feds, you know what? You can't come to certain areas here in Eagle Pass. We got this. Then over the weekend, a few migrants drowned. Now there's a back and forth between the state and the feds. That is on the other side of the break. And be sure to check out our weekly newsletter. Hit your inbox today. You can subscribe. Uh, you see that QR code top right of your screen. We'll, uh, we'll have some insights, some input throughout the week here as it is a big week in politics. And The Hill on News Nation returns on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Now in the state of Texas, Eagle Pass there is the center of the border fight. It is now escalating after a woman and two kids crossing the Rio Grande drowned over the weekend. The White House is blaming the Republican governor, Greg Abbott, and his decision to block federal agents from from patrolling that stretch of the border. They say, quote, one thing is clear. Governor Abbott's political stunts are cruel, inhumane, and dangerous. U.S. Border Patrol must have access to the border to enforce our laws. Meantime, the Texas Military Department, which oversees the state National Guard, is responding. They are calling the claims that all of this happened uh, because of the governor's decision, quote unquote, wholly inaccurate. Uh, First employee at the Department of Homeland Security, you were 20 something years ago. Um, Fast forward to now where you have a Republican governor blocking federal officials, and then this happens. Do you, 
Well, there's a there's a few things I want to say. One, of course, any deaths is horrible, and I think that um, we need to recognize that first and foremost. However, the federal government is not doing anything. 8.5 million people since this president took office has come over. 100 and 1.7 million of those are so-called getaways, meaning they don't know where they are. And then I just want to read one more thing that this scares me to death, which I say on the show all the time. Out of the 240,000 that came in over the border in December alone, 17 of them were on the terrorist watch list that we know about. So, so um, you have a you love to interrupt. You, you, you smirked at him, and I don't think you appreciated that I said you were at DHS 20 years ago. But it's a fact. But go on. Well, I was going to say I'm so young. Right? No, you are. You are. Um, but no, I uh, I think it's a big problem. And listen, like I said, if the federal government's not doing anything, I think Governor Abbott has every single right to do. But, what but he's just because doing you don't like state. what the federal government is doing, yes. it is still a federal issue, is it not? National he's actively facilitating illegal immigration in this country. Okay. He, he did not inherit this crisis. He created this crisis. This blood is on Joe Biden's hands, it's not Greg Abbott. It's on the laws of our country. Yeah, which he's not enforcing. Sure not enforcing. Which he's not enforcing. Which he's not to come to our country and claim mm-hmm. asylum. Now, Dean Phillips on our podcast, and I think this is a debate for Democrats, actually talked about figuring out a way that we're processing asylum mm-hmm. in country, making sure that we've got li- large uh, facilities to to make sure that people are safe in country. There are ideas. We Absolutely. need those ideas. And I'm sorry, but just people, you know, remain in Mexico, let them starve in Mexico. That's not a solution. See, that's the point right there. The Democrats are scared of the open borders crowd. To, to them, no one is illegal. And understand something about Biden's immigration policy. Human beings it is not, are not humane. illegal. It is not humane. It is hurting the migrants themselves. It is hurting well, American Martin citizens. Luther King just yesterday, Day. you had kids kicked out of a school in New York City for what? For illegal immigrants to house them. That should have never Joe Biden happened. puts America last. And this is the number Here's one Here's the problem with this discussion. This problem didn't start under Joe Biden. It didn't start under Donald Trump. This is a problem that we've had for a long time. And it's been politicized to the point where we're not going to be able to solve it because the, the success is in the problem, not in the solution. I it's better is, run is on the it. solution yeah. is the solution that what Greg Abbott is doing. It's saying, you know no, what? No, no. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Don't scream crazy. at me. It's just a question. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, you are going to basically block the federal jo- government from doing its job. National security is the job of the president. And I'm sorry, you just say, I want to do your job, so I'm going to take it. Let me, let me ask you this. Seven, 17 Court. people from the terrorist watch list crossed our country's borders and are lost. But the 9 11 hijackers December. came here through legal. I mean, they were here on yeah, visas. Exactly. Like, like, most of the people that, who are that's here. That's what we're talking about now. But it's terrorism. It's like, been but you're years. actively I get what you're facilitating saying. illegal immigration into this country. And Joe Biden could, with the laws on the books, Turn off seventy five percent of the problem. So right now, Donald, 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 Trump, Trump, Donald Trump did. That's why we have the it. lowest rate of illegal. When you set up DHS, years. Barack Obama, Obama did twice. When you set Obama. up DHS, did you ever envision a scenario in which a state governor would do this and get to this point? No, and and actually, you are right. Obviously, he's going against the federal law, but I think that there's such desperation. That's why he's doing it. But okay. it isn't the right thing to do. But. There has to be something to be done. All right. Uh, live look at Iowa City now, as we've mentioned, talked about, as you know, Iowans will confront record cold temperatures in order to cast their votes. Uh, in about two hours' time, the Iowa caucuses tonight, first votes of 2024. Joining us live, Elizabeth Vargas. She'll be co-hosting tonight's live primetime special coverage, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here on News Nation. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Did that live shot look snowy or what <laughs> that you just showed of Iowa? Whoa. Looks freezing. Yeah, uh, we're going to be looking at how much that snow and ice and wind chill at, what, 20, 25 degrees below zero is going to impact voter turnout. It's a huge deal. Um, Lots of, you know, breaking down. It will really affect, you know, people who are in rural Iowa, people who are older and might not have the capacity to brave the cold and the snow and the ice as well as some of the younger people and which candidates that may help or hurt. So it's going to be quite an exciting night after all these months of lead up and debates and. Uh, and and campaigning and stump speeches. You know, Finally, the voters will have their say tonight, so it's going to be an exciting evening. One thing I, I heard about, we were talking about this in our show meeting earlier today. Normally, at a caucus site, there would be lines, like, wrapped around the door, right? Yeah, no, be, not And today. you see this at polling site. Not today. One of the challenges is, at that caucus site, making sure they, they can get everyone inside 
and have some sort of a line just to make sure that everyone's fine. No, this is dangerous cold. We're talking record. This is the coldest Iowa caucus in modern history. So this is not some fun little, you know, hey, by the way, it's super cold there. Uh, This is the kind of cold that can kill. So it's very, very important. People stay safe, get out and vote. Uh, But of course, that could lead some people to stay home because it is so dangerous and is so risky to go outside. So we'll see how that affects. But it's going to be a great evening, um, a great start to the 2024 race. Indeed, indeed. And we'll see you here six o'clock Eastern on your show. And then News Nation coverage uh, starts after that. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great night. Yep. Coming up as well here on the Hill before we go. Final thoughts from the panel. That's on the other side of the break. Stay with us. News Nation tonight, it's an Iowa caucus special report. Trust Decision Desk 24 to bring you the votes as they come in. And the best political team across Iowa from key caucus sites. Tonight, starting at 7 Eastern, only on News Nation. It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at penfed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. You can't escape a traffic jam. Know what else you can't escape? Seasonal allergies. Ah! No! And you might think you can avoid that coffee stain until... Oh, really? You can't escape a lot of things in life. But you can escape prediabetes. Prediabetes captures one in three adults. There are usually no signs of prediabetes. In fact, most people don't even know they have it. But with early diagnosis, you can change the outcome and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. Take action by taking the one-minute risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. You might not be able to escape having this song stuck in your head. But you can escape prediabetes. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Each week, VA sends an email to over 13 million veterans. It's jam-packed with veteran discounts on hundreds of services, job listings, and information on home loans. Plus, access to many local events for veterans and their families. Subscribe for free at va.gov slash vet resources to learn more. This is an important message from the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Belt conveyors can be dangerous to miners working on or around them. Remember, always install proper guarding to prevent contact between miners and moving conveyor parts. Before working on a conveyor, disconnect the power and follow lockout tagout procedures. These simple steps can make a difference in keeping miners safe. Take time, save lives. For more resources, visit MSHA.gov. Are you prepared for an emergency or disaster? Because it's not a matter of if, but when. Don't find yourself saying, I'll trust water bottles and a flashlight to save the day, but I'll be proved wrong. With a tornado approaching, I'll realize that I like a wheelchair accessible shelter. When the floodwaters rise, I'll be up in the attic with 20 cans of beans. It's a recipe for disaster. Let's prepare so we all have a better story to tell. Get started at ready.gov slash older adults. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. This is the News Nation audio stream, available 24-7 on the News Nation app or on your Alexa. Just say, Play News Nation. Kids ask their parents a lot of questions. Why can't people fly? Gravity. Is the moon really made of cheese? Yep, cream cheese. When can I move into a big kid's car seat? Uh... For some questions, parents may not have the answer, but that's okay. They can't know everything, but knowing the right seat for their age and size will help protect them in a car crash. Find out more at nhtsa.gov slash the right seat. Where do babies come from? Good luck, Dad. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. I still see you. 
That's my son, Jared. But the world knew him as recording artist Juice World. At the height of his fame, we lost him to an accidental drug overdose. I'm Carmela Wallace. I started Live Free 999 to remove the stigma and normalize conversations around mental health and substance abuse. I want to ensure that we never lose another Jared. Go to livefree999.org to learn more. If you need urgent support, text LF 999 to 741741. Pass it on. Here's a short quiz. Who won Best Actress last year? Who won the World Series two years ago? And finally, name your favorite teacher. Pass it on. Now I'm guessing that the last question was the easiest. Why is that? Because that person made a difference in your life. So go ahead and make a difference. Because making a difference is in you. Pass it on. From passiton.com. Before we say goodbye, here is a story that caught our eye. An Air Force officer is now adding a crown. Madison March uh, won the Miss America title. She is 22 years old, and she is an active duty lieutenant. She won uh, on Sunday. She's the first service member to have this honor while studying uh, public policy at Harvard, by the way. She'll receive a $60,000 scholarship and the chance to travel to promote the Miss America brand. Congratulations. Very cool. Uh, good on her. Uh, around the table, before we go, some final thoughts. What are you looking forward to tonight? If Donald Trump does not have a massive win, then it breaks every narrative that he has this enthusiasm. <laughs> and so I, I'm just, I'm expecting Donald Trump is probably going to get his people to the polls. It's probably going to be a landslide. But it will be questionable to see whether the Iowa Republican Party is able to manage this with the cold and all Michael. of the issues. Nikki Haley's in for a lose-lose night. DeSantis has the groundwork. It's cold outside, and no matter how close she gets, it's not going to be enough to matter. Is it lose-lose for her? No. I don't, I, you don't. I don't think it's lose. I still don't think it's lose-lose because we're one week away from New Hampshire, and I think she'll do very well there. What? But I think Trump doesn't get over 50. <laughs> I think that Trump breaks the margin of victory record in Iowa, which is 12 points by Bob Dole. How close he gets to 50, I don't know. But the whole give me point. a number. 48. 48. So you, you think that's right? points down. You just, you just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking points. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess that the turnout is 56. I'm going to tell you that the, tur- <laughs> the higher the turnout is, the closer to 50 Donald Trump I'd gets. Be, okay. Of course. I'd be surprised if he doesn't get a massive number. I think that is a massive number. 50. It is nobody's. I think. Ever you think, you think real quick, Ashley. You, you think Haley gets to what? Oh, I don't. I'm not. I don't. You're know. not going to put it. Haley gets to no, 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 Haley gets to It's a coin flip between no, Haley think, and Sanders. It really is. All right, got to leave it there. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow and have a whole tomorrow. lot to talk about. Uh, <laughs> until then, Elizabeth Vargas reports and special coverage from News Nation. It's going to be a great night. Stay with us. <laughs>